Good morning, everybody. Tito Zanissen here from the Versafile Group. I will start sharing my screen right now. Okay, welcome to the session today, Best Practices and Lessons Learned for IBM FileNet in the Cloud. I'm Tilo Zanikson with the Versafile Group, and we have Kevin Trin as an IBM subject matter expert available via chat. So please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat, and uh, Kevin will try to answer them. And I also plan for some Q&A time at the end of the chat. Also available via chat is Sean Fitzpatrick, principal of the Versafile Group. He will be able to assist with any uh, less technical questions. Today's talk, we split in three parts. Part one, why FileNet containers uh, compare containers versus traditional deployment and walk through a few of the deployment options you have. The talk is about cloud, but um, containers just go um, just go along, go along with with cloud and make a make a lot of sense if you want to move to cloud. So we'll spend uh, quite some time also talking about containers. Part two, we'll walk you through one of our recent customer success stories, and then summarize uh, best practices and lessons learned for move to containers and move to cloud. And then we'll wrap it up with a Q and A and um, finish the session. The session has been recorded, so. Um, please be aware of that. Let's first move um, move for the topic why finite containers. And one one thing I want to remind you of is the um, the IBM support model. IBM changed the support model for most finite components uh, to a continuously delivery support model, which means you get fixes for the latest two updates, which is in the case of the FileNet um, Content Platform Engine 554 and 553. And we see IBM releases new updates roughly every six months. So that means your deployment model, your rollout needs to, needs to be able to keep up with this, uh, with this pace. Um, there's some more details to the continuously delivery model that could be, um, that could be Deployment tagged as a long-term release, which we have not seen in the in the past for the FileNet software. So that might be changing the uh, the outlook a little bit. But right now, that's that's what the situation is. So you need to you need to adapt your deployment and rollout process to be able to keep up with this. And containers is is a very good way to achieve that because they allow for a very simple and fast deployment upgrade. They are also um, help you with, uh, with with a simple rollback if you need to roll back. And of course, if the database schema in the back changed, there's a little bit more work involved, but otherwise it's uh, very simple if you want to roll back the version. And also containers allow you to scale out very easily, scale up, scale down, horizontal, vertical. You can do it manually, we can automate that. So that's uh, lots of flexibility built in the, the containers. Containers also allow you, allow you to easily move uh, move from an on-premise setup to a cloud or to have a mix. So if you want to start right now with uh, with the final containers, you could do it on-prem, and then when you're ready, move move to the cloud. Also, if you choose today one cloud provider and later on you want to move to to a different cloud provider or you change your your provider setup, then uh, containers allow you to uh, easily move move your deployment uh, to the new provider. So lots of flexibility built in the FileNet containers. Um, important to, to note, so there are certain components which are not yet containerized, which is, for example, data cap, IBM content collector, and uh, business automation workflow, BAW, the successor of IBM case. Some of the components, especially the Windows only one, like data cap and ICC, we don't expect to see soon um, in a containerized fashion. Uh, business automation workflow, however, is something we uh, expect here very shortly to be available uh, as a containerized deployment. 
Um, some of the components like DataCap, even so they're not available as a container and properly will not be for a while. They can work together with a containerized backend. So they can work together with your containerized content navigator, can work together with your containerized content platform engine. So you could just keep them alongside in traditional setup with your um, other components which are containerized. Let's compare container deployment versus traditional deployment. On the traditional uh, non-containerized setup on the right-hand side, what do you have? You start with an uh, operating system, which could be either Windows, Linux, or AIX, uh, supported flavor of, of each of that. By the finite software, you need an application server, WebSphere, or WebLogic. You need then uh, LDAP system, Active Directory, or others are supported, and you need a database, Oracle DB2, or Microsoft SQL. And the uh, traditional setup, you can automate in various ways. Uh, we have seen and worked with customers who did it on Puppet, um, or you can do the native script of the operating system, Shell Bash, or um, on Windows like PowerShell, which uh, we in Versafile did to, to automate and simplify the installation of a uh, FileNet system. But these uh, automation options are typically fairly labor intense to, to start with, to come up with the first uh, version and also uh, quite, um, quite intense to keep up. So to make sure that every new version um, will uh, still work your, your script or your automation option. And if you want to go to automate your um, scale out or upgrades, so there's also some, um, some specialties you need to be aware of. So on the containerized side, what do you have? You a few layers just collapse. You don't need to worry about it anymore. Your first, however, is the container orchestration layer you need. And you need to um, pick a supported one, which could be either CNCF certified Kubernetes, that's Cloud Native Compute Foundation, or IBM's Red Hat OpenShift, that's a, a supported container orchestration, or sometimes also referred as container runtime. Um, solutions you can use. You still need an LDAP system, which could be Active Directory or others. Watch out, the list of supported LDAPs is smaller than on the traditional setup currently. So just uh, be aware of that. We have also um, seen customer asking us often, can we use Azure AD um, for, for the LDAP to fill the LDAP need of the system? Yes, you can. However, the um, the Azure ID needs to have the add-on domain um, services, Azure Active Directory domain services, which pretty much means Microsoft is, is hosting for you and fully managed two or more domain controllers um, behind the scenes. So you don't need to worry about that. A funny anecdote, the last time I checked around six to eight months ago, this um, domain controllers Microsoft deployed for you was still Windows 2012 R2. So so much for Microsoft being on the bleeding edge from their own software. Um, on the database side, you still need a database. Um, you can pick between Oracle DB2 and Microsoft SQL Server. And we also expect to soon to see Postgres as an option. Postgres specifically would open up quite a few options um, to have a native um, cloud native database because most of the cloud providers offer you to um, run a database which um, use the Postgres engine. Um, the database itself can be a traditional setup, can be a containerized setup, or could be fully managed by, the, by a cloud provider if they offer it. Just watch out that the database um, supports all the feature required by the uh, IBM FileNet software, like in Microsoft SQL's case, they need XA transaction enabled. So you can see the containerized deployment is, is quite simplified. What are the details uh, of a finite container? So first of all, your deployment option. Um, in the past, you could use Helm charts or YAML configuration, straight up YAML configuration files. Uh, these options are no longer supported with version 554 of the CPE. The only way to deploy containers is now via Kubernetes operators, or OpenShift operators. So that's your only deployment um, option. So if you in the past worked with, uh, with finite containers and you might use the uh, uh, Helm or YAML, that's not an option anymore. Let's take a more of a detailed look in what's what's part of the container. So the FileNet CPE uh, container would be um, right now um, looks at 700 megabytes, so it's a fairly small container. And of the 700 megabytes, you already have 250 megabytes only for the CPE file. So bottom line, they're very small, have a limited attack surface, if that's a concern. 
um, under the covers, you have a Red Hat Universal Base Image, UBI. And um, also you have WebSphere Liberty running in that container and the IBM Java runtime. Some uh, further limitations you need to be aware of. Right now, the um, only supported connection method is via WSI. You cannot use Enterprise Java Beans, EJ Beans. Uh, I don't think that will change soon. Um, so just be aware of that. And uh, if you have any custom solution right now who leverage EJ Bean, you would need to um, adjust them to, to support WSI if you want to go to containerization. Um, you can still use with WSI, you can still use .NET Java, so that's, you, that doesn't limit you, but um, the Enterprise Java Beans is not something you can use. Content Navigator Task Manager was not supported um, or was not available on, container, on container, containerized fashion for the longest time, but uh, with the latest release, there are some features available, but it's not a full featured uh, task manager yet. So some features like the box share or IR sweep via task manager are not available yet in a containerized um, environment. Also, if your current, um, if your current system uses um, IBM Virtual Member Manager, VMM, that is not available in a containerized form yet. Uh, VMM means that your finance system doesn't um, or fully leverage the WebSphere um, LDAP connection and you don't need to reconfigure it inside your uh, FileNet domain. So if you use that currently, you would need to change that before you can move to containers. Okay, let's um, go to a few of the deployment options you have. So here, the first one, you just see your traditional on-premise setup. Um, we see the Windows um, support the flavor of Linux or ARX. So that's probably where you're coming from right now. And um, next, if you want to stay on premise, which you can, um, and you want to start containerized systems, you could um, just uh, containerize uh, all the components who support containerization and then leave other components who do not support containerization in a traditional setup. That's a classic example. If you have data cap and um, core finite backend, uh, you could uh, convert your core finite backend to deploy it in a containerized way and then keep your data cap in a traditional Windows, Windows setup, Windows VMs. Next, um, if you want to move certain things to the cloud, um, and this is considering no containerization, we'll get later to that. If you want to move certain things to the cloud, you pick your cloud provider, which you would leverage as an infrastructure as a service provider, and then you move your workload you want to move from on-prem to the cloud. You just move them in traditional uh, setup to the cloud. So it would be still running a Windows VM or Linux VM, or if your cloud provider supported support AIX. Um, you can leave some stuff on-prem, put some stuff on the cloud, so you have a an, an classic hybrid cloud approach. Um, if you want to completely get rid of your um, on-premise data center, you can just, uh, in the same manner, uh, move all the all the workload to the cloud. Again, this is traditional non-containerized deployment options. Now let's look into the options with uh, containerization. So now you need to choose your cloud provider and also need to um, choose a comp uh, containerization orchestration um, layer, which often if you choose a cloud provider would be a platform as a service, PAS, and then you move um, the components which can be containerized to the cloud, in the containerized fashion, and then you could move a workload which cannot be containerized yet, like a data cap, you move that um, also to the cloud if desired or parts of it. In this scenario, you could leave things on-prem or you move everything to the cloud that depends on on um, your use case and what makes the most sense in this scenario. Let's move to a more recent success story of one of our customers, which was a large university in the US. And they were seeking uh, help for their finance department. And in the first phase, they were uh, needing a solution for their accounts payable department, um, which needed to integrate with uh, PeopleSoft financials. And in phase one, um, 
We are um, looking at around 6,000 documents a day which need to be processed and there are 700 uh, users involved. We stood up a brand new uh, FileNet system with DataCap uh, for them. And this system is fully managed by uh, Versa File on AWS. That's their cloud provider. The customer already had existing infrastructure and existing artifacts on AWS. Um, so that was the reason why AWS was chosen as, as a cloud provider. The reason why, why the customer choose cloud, this was part of their overall strategy, uh, which is cloud first, and they wanted to reduce burden and, and strains on their um, on-premise data centers and also on their IT department. So that was uh, the reasons why they choose cloud. Let's walk a little bit more detail through what this customer architecture looked like and um, how the flow is from, from an end user. So from an end user perspective, um, pretty straightforward. You have um, end user scanning um, scanning invoices, accounts payable related uh, documents, which are processed with, with data cap and then stored in the, in the finance system running on AWS and uh, end up in an uh, AWS S3 bucket that the, that's a storage point used by the finance system. Um, you have then users on premise on campus who can retrieve and, and work with these um, documents. And you also have uh, people working from home right now, especially, and um, you have people on the road. They're accessing, accessing the system through a publicly available URL through an uh, AWS application load balancer, ALB. The, the system in a core on the right-hand side here, we have the um, AWS EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Services, that hosts the core finance system, which is the content platform engine content search services, CSS, and content navigator, ICN. The um, container system leverage AWS EFS, Elastic File System, which is the AWS version of, of NFS. In simple terms, uh, will lever it leverage, the container leverage that for the configuration and the log store. So the configuration files are there and, and any logging related information. <clears throat> the documents itself end up, as mentioned, in an AWS S3 bucket. That's um, where this uh, system stores a, stores a document, the content. Also on AWS, we have various data cap um, VMs who, um, who host the data cap solution. Both the finance system and data cap leverage Microsoft SQL as a backend database, which runs in a Windows VM in AWS in the same uh, virtual network. On the front end, we have the application load balancer from AWS who, who distributes the load to the, to the various nodes. Uh, the customer already had an existing um, LDAP in, in the AWS cloud, so there was no work required for the LDAP, so the connection was established through an um, AWS VPC peer, so there was no, um, no effort required there. The customer also leveraged uh, another cloud, uh, the customer leverage Azure, uh, Azure AD as an IDP for their SAML. So uh, if a customer, um, if the end user hits the FileNet system like Content Navigator, um, they get first routed to the Azure AD for the SAML authentication. So that's where the multi-factor authentication happens and uh, the sign-in will be monitored. Okay. Let's summarize a few of the best practices and lessons learned for the move to containers. So first of all, we suggest start with the POC or POT, whatever you want to uh, want to tag it. We have seen where the customer has not done any experience with containerization yet, either on premise or in the cloud. And then um, the final application is, is would be the first one, which is great. That's good. However, we suggest you start with the POC to make sure uh, everybody involved in 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 the solution understands how the containerization works and what things you need to be aware of and what things you you don't need to worry about anymore due to the fact that it's containerized so we'll st suggest start with the poc pot first um what you need to do in your journey to containerization is you need to pick your container orchestration solution supported by ibm filenet which is right now as mentioned cncf certified kubernetes or red app openshift 
Um, you also should elect who will own this containerization layer. We have seen two viewpoints kind of coming out with, with the discussion with, with our customers. The one viewpoint is that customer sees it, oh, that's just like WebSphere kind of thing. It's a, something you need to run your FileNet solution on. So the FileNet application team should just own it. So it's a one viewpoint. So the IT infrastructure or server ops team is a little bit hands off. Just say you, you need that to run your FileNet system. So you own it, you're responsible for it. That's a one point uh, viewpoint. The other point is uh, to compare it more to like the layer of virtualization, like who runs right now your VMs, who runs your hyper, uh, hypervisor, which is typically the, the IT or server ops team. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a better fit to, um, to see it uh, on, that, on that level, but that depends on, um, on your organization and how you want to structure it. It's important that whoever owns that containerization layer understands the support and release cycle of the of the container orchestration solution, because especially on the Kubernetes, uh, for example, we've seen fairly rapid um, versions and uh, tight support of, of older versions. So it's not like you can hang back for a few years without, without touching it. that. Depends which potential cloud provider you choose or um, on-premise Kubernetes solution. The um, the, the vendor might offer a longer support. We've seen it with AWS, where they hang back a few versions from the latest Kubernetes and um, support support a few older versions for a longer time. Um, important also to understand on the, in that same level is that even if you choose fully managed Kubernetes um, with fully managed worker nodes, there's still some work involved. And that's on both, on AWS, EKS, on, for example, on Microsoft, it's AKS solution. In both of these, um, for example, in order to get um, updates to the operating system who runs the worker nodes, you need to reboot them on the AKS scenario. And in the uh, EKS scenario from AWS, you need to, uh, roughly every month, you need to update them so that they get the new, um, new updates that way. It's also important for you to understand the implication of, of kind of bundled, the bundled approach here. The container bundles in the operating system to a certain degree. The, container bundles in the application server, WebSphere Liberty. That means any vulnerability you want to mitigate, you need to deploy and get a new um, container from IBM. In the past, you could just patch the operating system or just patch the Java runtime or the application server if, if the vulnerability was related to this. Now you need to deploy a new container, which is fairly simple and the container rollout is, is uh, straightforward. But your, if the, if the um, new container version comes as an interim fix or as an, a new finite version, you, you need to um, make sure that your deployment process like regression testing and such is, um, is capable of, of keeping up with that. The attack surface, as mentioned, is, is fairly small on the containers because they are only the essentials are, are in there. Um, also, you need to understand there are certain limitations right now with containerization. There's difference what supported uh, container versus traditional non-containers, like on the database side. We have seen this on the Active Directory side. Um, so there's a few limitations you need to be aware of. And also, please be aware that the limitations are different between the cloud pack for automation and the base FileNet uh, CM containers. Cloud pack for automation, for example, doesn't support Microsoft SQL yet. The reason is uh, much more components in the cloud pick for automations, and some of them do not support SQL yet. The binary fights are exactly the same if you go container uh, for cloud pick for automations versus uh, CMCM containers, uh, FNCM containers. So there's a limitation, just make sure you're aware of them. Mm, reminder here, if there's any limitation which stops you to go to containers, please reach out to your partner or to your IBM account rep to raise, raise this concern and raise this roadblock so that IBM can prioritize accordingly what they need to focus on to release next. Okay, next, um, let's move to the lessons learned and best practices for your move to cloud. First, you should determine in your organization who owns the cloud. That's maybe a little bit of a loaded bullet point here. But what, what I'm trying to say is um, 
somebody needs to own the cloud, somebody, um, uh, you need to have a concept, um, what do you want to run in cloud, how you want to run it, how you want to add other workloads, do you want to keep it per application, separate per application, segregated that way, you want to keep it in one big data center for you, an extension of your data center, so there's few approaches, and you need to, somebody who, who has the keys to the cloud to give to give access or certain access to 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 your contractor or partner or to the application owners who should work with various artifacts of of your chosen cloud so you need to um you need to um structure it that way also keep in mind the cloud is not static what i'm trying to say here is we've seen on on various cloud providers that they are um change their change their apis they change their um their command line interfaces we've seen on, on azure a couple of years ago they changed their role-based authentication control model um, quite heavily so there's changes there which are typically for the better um, but um, yeah you need to adapt it you get one of one's notice so you need to potentially adapt your your process how you how you use the cloud and how you roll out things to that um, we suggest you aim for containerization. In, in, even if you're on premise, you should plan for containerization, but it just makes so much more sense if you go to cloud because in the cloud, most providers offer you the containerization layer um, right there available. So you don't need to, to, um, to stood that up in your, in your on-premise environment on your cloud provider because it's already there uh, to a certain degree managed for you. It depends which one you, which one you choose, which offering. Important part to figure out is the authentication authorization. Right now, the finance system still needs an LDAP. So you need, you need to make sure that the finance system can connect to, to an LDAP. That could be an LDAP replicated in the cloud, in your cloud provider. Uh, it could be in an LDAP on-prem if you have a strong enough, a fast enough link between via secure VPN or such. So just make sure you have that uh, sorted out. In the future, we've seen um, movement from the IBM side that they want to get rid of the dependencies on LDAP, but right now that's still required. And um, we also suggest you consider SAML. There are quite a few advantages of SAML to monitor your sign-ins, uh, allow multi-factor authentication and such. Yeah. It's actually a, a small video we did on, on SAML where you can see SAML working with Content Navigator um, and the FileNet system. So check out our YouTube channel for that. As a reminder, um, because many customers asked us is, hey, can we use the fully hosted Microsoft SQL database on Azure or in AWS? Unfortunately not, because right now, both of these do not support XA transactions, which are required for Microsoft SQL um, by the FileNet system. So just um, be aware of that. Last but not least, even so it's a cloud and there are certain resiliency already baked in. And if you go with, containerization, there's another layer of resiliency already um, baked in that way. You still need to plan for disaster recovery, backup and restore. Just being on cloud doesn't mean you can completely neglect this, this topics. Um, the level which disaster you need to plan for might be different to, to on-prem and the, um, the implementation of, of your disaster recovery plan might be easier because uh, of and the cloud provider already having infrastructure in, in various locations, so that, that uh, simplifies things, but you still need to, to plan for that. Okay, that's, that's my uh, slide deck. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me um, via email. Um, there's a few videos we put online on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, SAML with multi-factor authentication for Content Navigators one, and also an overview about FileNet containers on uh, Kubernetes, in this case, it was uh, AKS, uh, Azure Cloud. So feel free to check them out um, if, you, if you're interested in that. Okay, let's uh, jump into any questions. If we have, got a few minutes left here, and I think we can actually run a few minutes over. I think they will not cut us out cold. Okay, so last question I see here. Is it LDAP or SAML or is LDAP required no matter what? So LDAP is required no matter what. Right now, if you want to use uh, FileNet um, containers, you need an LDAP system. So that's required no matter what. SAML is optional, but strongly suggested. Let me see if I can scroll up here. Is there any other questions left? I'm not sure if I can scroll all the way, all the way back here. Um...
Yeah, so IBM um, Enterprise Records is not available yet as in containerization. Um, so we expect that soon, but currently not available. I think that question got already answered. Microsoft SQL fully hosted um, by Azure is not supported because of lack of XA transactions. Okay, some people have technical problems. I hope you sorted that out. Okay, I think that was it. Any other questions? Otherwise, I will stop the recording and this session will be available if you want to um, check it out again. So feel free to, to review it. We also plan to put it up on our YouTube channel soon. And I will share the slide um, here via, um, via this uh, Be My App tool. I just need to remove some of the transitions so it's better readable via PDF. Okay, thank you everybody and have a great day. Bye-bye.